It had, to do with, it had to do with the Trinity, the mystery of godliness. We did speak on divorce, but toward the end of the chapter, he got into the mystery of godliness, he says, is without controversy. In other words, and there's been controversy this day about the mystery of godliness. But it's his nature that seems to be a mystery. He has a threeness about him, and yet a oneness about him. He's revealed himself as the Father, as the Son, as the Holy Spirit, right? Jesus says He's one with the Father. Philippians says Jesus lowered Himself and took on the form of a bondservant as a human. Um, the Bible also says that the Lord is the Spirit. Right? And we looked at in Isaiah... God addresses Himself as the first and the last. And then yet in the book of Revelation, Jesus addresses Himself as the first and the last. As the Alpha and the Omega. Right? So there is this threeness and yet oneness. And Paul says that God was manifested in the flesh. When was God manifested in the flesh? In the person of? Jesus Christ. Justified in the Spirit. That was... Jesus Christ. Remember, because he was condemned to death, but he was just his innocence was always justified. Do you understand? Even the Roman soldier said, Truly, this is the Son of God. Because you could tell by who he was, he wasn't guilty of any crime. He was seen by angels, he was preached among the Gentiles, right? Wasn't God before Jesus always preached to the Jews? So he was preached to the Gentiles. This is all, the mystery of godliness is all found in the person of Christ. And he was received up in glory. And then, of course, that's the ascension after the resurrection. And uh, in Acts chapter 1, the angels said to the disciples, Why do you gaze up in heaven? This Jesus that has ascended will come back in the same way. Right? All right, you guys are looking at me like I've got three heads. <laughs> Do we need to pray? All right, let's pray. Let's, Father, as we get into chapter 4, I pray, Lord, hone us in to the deep truths of your word, God, that our roots will go deeper and deeper with you, that our limbs will go higher and higher for your glory. Father, we pray that we do bear good fruit for you, that you would be glorified, and the world will believe upon you. Make us the people you desire us, to be in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. All right, so chapter 4, as we get into it, Paul says now the spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith. So what's the faith built on? What he just talked about, the mystery of godliness, right? Some will depart from that, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared as with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from foods, which God created to be received with thanksgiving, by those who believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving, for it's sanctified by the word of God and prayer. So, I'm going to stop right there. This is a, obviously a prophecy. The Spirit expressly says that in latter times, or later times, this, these are the things you're going to see. Okay? Coming into this, to understand this a little bit better, there were two ages in Jewish thought. One was the current age in which we live, and then there would be the age to come, right? And in the middle of that is the day of the Lord. Zechariah talks about that. The prophets talked about that. This day of the Lord, or the day of reckoning when Jesus would come. They also believed that much like us, many of the Jewish uh, sects, if you will, believed in the demonic. That though they were also angels, they were also demons. So Paul is speaking to them in what they already know of, that there are deceiving spirits speaking lies and hypocrisy. Now to help you understand a little bit more of the context, 
what was po a popular belief system in this day? Hey, there we go. <laughs> First Timothy. That's an, <laughs> an audio Bible? Nice. <laughs> I thought angels were speaking. I was like, hey, go ahead, preach. <laughs> I'll step aside. Suri <laughs> came to church. Suri came, yeah. <laughs> the prophet Suri. <laughs> Gnosticism was a big um, belief of the day. And I'll, I'll write it up here. And the Gnostics believe this root word here gnostic means knowledge so gnostics believed they had the secret knowledge of godliness all right so let me just stop have you ever heard someone say they're an agnostic mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and what do they say as an agnostic what do they mean by that I don't know if I believe. I don't know if I believe or not, or I believe something's out there, but I'm not sure what it is. Yeah. All right. So, a Gnostic says I have knowledge. The prefix a means not. So, someone who says they're agnostic says they don't have knowledge of the holy. Gnostics popularly, without going into great detail, believe that everything came from one angel. And um, almost like cells in the human body split <laughs> and make another cell. They believed that an angel split and became another angel, an angel split and became another angel. And there was like these hierarchies of angels. And the last of all these angels that split, the one closest to the earth, they believed his name was Christ. That's why in the book of, or not the book of John or the Gospel of John, in the letter of John, he says any spirit that says Jesus has not come in the flesh is an antichrist spirit. What he's referring to is the Gnostics of that time because they believed in a hierarchy of angels. You see? So now, as we get into what he's saying about deceiving spirits, what he's getting at is, is this Gnostic belief, because Gnostics believed that the physical body was evil. It's not far from Christianity in some of the basic elements. And that the spirit was good. The Bible teaches that our spirit has died, and it's made alive upon being born again of the Holy Spirit. That's in Ephesians chapter 2. Okay? So, what a lot of these kind of Gnostics did uh, was the greater you could sacrifice your flesh, kind of the more holy you were. Now, as Christians, we are to put to death the deeds of the flesh, right? That's what the Holy Spirit does. He helps us overcome some of those things that are stumbling blocks in our life. All right? But Gnosticism is rooted in like a false humility, if you will. Like some of these um, people would basically lean up against the rock so they wouldn't fall asleep, a jagged rock so they couldn't fall asleep because sleep was of the body and that was evil. Yet the Bible says that God gives His chosen ones rest, right? And he encourages us to enter into his rest. They also deprive themselves of food to the point of like near starvation, you know, because food is for the physical body and therefore it was evil. And they would even forbid people to marry because marriage fulfills a bodily function or a bodily, a natural bodily thing. And so now you look at this, you understand where Paul's coming from. What, are they, what does he say? Deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared as with a hot iron. Like, they're not even realizing what God gave. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, all right, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. So these are things we don't have to get into these false humility things about, right? In other words, the end times, Paul says, there's going to be deceptions. Now there's lots of deceptions. He's choosing this 
kind of one thing to really hone in on because the Gnostics were very prevalent around the church. Matter of fact, in Galatians, what was a prevalent heresy were the, um, the Judaizers. They were so-called believers, but they were making the people fulfill certain laws, be circumcised, and things of that nature in order to be justified before God. So in that letter, the Galatians, Paul is addressing the law versus the Spirit. It's the Spirit that justifies you, not the works of the law. In this letter to Timothy, he's addressing the Gnostic beliefs. False humility. The denial of self um, you know, versus the good things that God gave. For they're saying, deny food, deny yourself food, and deny yourself a wife. But Proverbs 18 says that he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. So God made that. The, God spoke to Peter in Acts chapter 10, didn't he? And he had this whole sheet come down, and there were all kinds of creatures on it. And he heard a voice say, kill and eat, in this trance that Peter was having. And Peter says, well, I'm a Jew. I don't eat those things. And the voice says, don't call unclean what I've made good. And Peter, after three times, I think, he kills and eats and so on and so forth. But then God reveals to him, it was also not just to put his stamp of approval on foods, but it was his God's approval that the Gentiles um, were also to receive the gospel message. So we kind of hit two birds with one stone. It was like an object lesson. But God gave us food to eat. He gave us a particular body to work a certain way that we would need food, that we're not supposed to. Now, is fasting a good discipline? Sure. But you're not justified by fasting. You know, fasting can be a tool to help you grow in your um, fellowship with God. It can help you, uh, like Jesus said, some demons only come out through, fa uh, through fasting and prayer. So sometimes living a life of fasting, you have a kind of a, a measure of the Holy Spirit where you walk in the power of God. Does that make sense? But this is the counterfeit of the devil is to, to all deprive, oh, well, if fasting's good, deprive yourself altogether. Now, what that puts the onus on is your performance before God. And we're saved by what? Grace through faith. It's about what He did for us, not about what you did. The things we do is in response to our love to God. Does that make sense? All right, so what do we do? So let's look at verses 6 through 10. What do we do? Paul says, If you instruct the brethren in these things, you'll be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and of the good doctrine which you've carefully followed. But reject profane and old wives' fables, and exercise yourself toward godliness. For bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of life that now is, and of that which is to come. The two ages, right? The one now and the one that is to come. This is a faithful saying and a worthy of all acceptance. For to this end, we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. See, God's the Savior, right? You're not the Savior. People aren't the Savior. So he's saying, we're reproached because we trust in the living God, which is foolishness to the natural person. Every religion in the world, you have to climb some type of ladder in order to reach God, so to speak. You know, uh, I was raised in a mainline church, and you had to do these seven sacraments through your life. And then God might accept you. You know, but Jesus says, you know, it's the sick who need a physician. He likened himself to a physician. Like when you're sick, you don't go, oh, I gotta get better, and then I go see the doctor. And then he might approve me. <laughs> what do you do when you're sick? 
You go to the doctor because he has what you need in order to get better. That's the whole difference, Christianity versus every other religion in the world. Is he is the medicine. He is the bread of life. He is the light of the world. He is everything we need. He is the vine. We are the branches. Instruct. Now, I'll say this. When you stop learning, you stop teaching. When you stop learning, you stop teaching. You gotta, in order to instruct, you've got to keep learning. Always be in a posture of learning. I have a, uh, a friend who has a, uh, a brother who is like probably smarter than Einstein. Uh, an ap like a, a legit genius. And um, in his family, he's the only one who became a born-again Christian. <laughs> this genius. But he stopped going to church my friend told me, because I've read the Bible several times and I know it all already. I don't need to go to church. Oh I said he's not a genius. Because <laughs> guess what? I've read the Bible probably more times than his brother has. And guess what? I'm still learning. And I'm still learning how to apply it is the other thing. The Word is living. The Word is living. It never changes. That's right. It's, so there's new applications of this Word because my life is always changing, right? Mm -hmm. I don't go through the same things, you know, every day. There are new challenges in our lives as we, as we grow, as we get older, as the seasons change, as the world changes. You know, there's, i got to read this to keep learning how to apply this Word, right? What else do we do? We avoid tales. Old wives' fables, he's saying, right? And um, well, well, how did he word it here? Reject profane and old wives' fables. Exercise yourself toward godliness. In other words, keep the main thing the main thing. Go with me to Colossians chapter 2. All right, and we're going to pick up at verse 8. Colossians 2, verse 8. Paul says, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in Him, meaning Christ, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. You are complete in Him, who is the head of all principality and power. So let's keep the main thing the main thing. It's all about who Jesus is and what He has done for you and what He's calling you to do. Verse 11, In Him you are also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. Remember, we don't go back to the law of the circumcision of the flesh in order to be justified before God. You are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with Him in baptism, in which you were also raised with Him through faith in the working of God, who raised Him from the dead. You just got baptized, right? In August. Okay. You were buried with Him in baptism under the water, and you're raised with Him to life. And you, being dead in your trespass and uncircumcision of your flesh, He's made you alive together with Him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Some trespasses? All, all. all trespasses. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which is the law, uh, which was contrary to us, he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. So let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival, or a new moon, or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance, or the reality, some translations say, is of Christ. Let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility, and worship of angels. We don't worship angels, do we? 
Oh. And we worship the Lord. See, the Gnostic system of angels was being introduced to these people. I would, I would gather that's why he's writing this. Don't worship angels. <laughs> Intruding into those things which he's not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not beholding fast to the head, from whom all the body nourished in it together by joints and ligaments, grows with the increase that is from God. Who's the head? Jesus Christ. Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourselves to regulations? Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which all concern things which perish with the using according to the commandments and doctrines of men. You see? Don't go after those wise, old wise tales and fables. Keep the main thing the main thing. I'm justified because Jesus Christ has died for me. I live under righteousness because the power of the Holy Spirit and the presence and person of the Spirit lives in me and guides me into all truth. Is that bearing witness with you? The obedience that I give God is birthed out of the love in which I have for Him and the grace in which He's given me. So don't add laws to yourself. But... Let the fruit of the Spirit grow in you. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, kindness, self-control. Apart from such, there is no law. Alright? Let's keep going here. Four, verse 8, bodily exercise. Profits little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having the promise of life, which now is, and the one that is to come. So seek after the things of God. Get the big picture. He is the big picture. Remember, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. Right? Mm -hmm. Paul knows that. There's a book, uh, Mighty Wind by Mal Tari. Talks about the, the revival in Indonesia. And they couldn't get the people to break from having statues and icons and candles and mm. stuff. So one time when the, <laughs> the priest was preaching, all the statues crumbled and fell to the ground. Wow. And uh, wow. I just got was trying to show them that this is not what you are to worship. Right, right. So he's saying that. Where was it? Indonesia? Yeah. The revival that happened in Indonesia. These statues were worshipped and they couldn't get the people to break from worshipping statues. So while the, <laughs> while the man was preaching, <laughs> they all crumbled. So God showed his power. You know, and again, it's, it is, it's, it's avoid tales and fables and so on and so forth, you know. Seek the big picture and that's the Lord. You know, he says here, bodily, profit, uh, bodily exercise does profit a little bit, but godliness. In other words, you and I are to be working out our growth, so to speak, our development. That's our workout. We're athletes for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We seek out God, His disciplines, His ways, His character. We are God's athletes. Watch. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. First Corinthians chapter 9. This is where Paul has mentioned he becomes all things to all men that he might win some. And if you go to verses uh, 24, we're going to read through the end of the chapter, verses 24 to 27. He says, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain the prize. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run in this way, not with uncertainty, 
In this way I fight, not as one who beats the air. But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest, when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Right? So he's like, I have to do all these things that I'm preaching, or else I become disqualified from the race, so to speak. You know, but he's making here another analogy to Timothy about, you know, bodily exercise does profit a little bit, but basically, exercise in yourself in godliness. If you're going to compete for something, compete for the crown of righteousness. And we don't have to compete for it. He's just making an analogy. Jesus has already won it for us. Remember, He imputes His righteousness to you. Before you ever do a righteous thing, God has imputed it to you. Remember, what he's basically saying is the big picture is that God is the ultimate goal. You know, it's, it's not an easy life. I like what Pastor Mario says, that people say, oh, Jesus is your crutch. <laughs> he's like, oh, really? Try walking it. And tell me if it's my crutch. It's a tough life to walk, right? The greatness of the goal makes the life worthwhile, doesn't it? The ultimate goal is Him. The greatness of Him makes this disciplined life. You know, Paul says we suffer reproach. Sometimes we suffer reproach. Probably not as blatant as they did. But guess what? People are still excluding you from things and they're mocking you behind your back and so on and so forth because you name Jesus as your Savior. It's a tough life but the ultimate goal makes it worth living. Let's go to verse 12. Or 11 through 16. He says, These things command and teach. Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them, that your progress may be evident to all. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this you will save both yourself and those who hear you. So now he's getting down to the nitty gritty. You know, you really want to grow in this? You know, avoid all the heresies. You know, start instructing. Keep learning. Avoid these tales. Keep the main thing the main thing. Seek the big picture. But now, like, going forward, he addresses the issue of Timothy's youth. And really, for centuries, starting with the early church, and, and I, I would even imagine into today, Older folks assume younger folks fall. So, Timothy being young. Now, Timothy may not be as young as you think. You know, there was a 15-year period that he even walked with Paul. So, I would venture to guess he was probably in his 30s. But youth in this generation, of Paul's generation, was 40 years and younger. That was young. It was the age that one would be in the military, so to speak. So, Timothy was, we can guess, he was less than 40 years old by being called young. And we can probably assume he was older than 20. You know what I mean? I would say he's between 20 and 40. I'd kind of put him right in his early 30s, maybe. But he's saying, let no one despise you or look down on you because of your youth. You know, um, but basically, do all these things. What does he say? Be an example in what? Throw out. What does he say to be an example in what? Actions. In what? His actions. His actions. All right, but what specifically from the text? In love. In love. In what? And his, his speech. So how he is to love, how he speaks. What else? In faith. In his faith. Keep teaching, it says. Read the Bible in public. Keep teaching, read the Bible in public. So yeah, going forward, all these things be an example. In other words, 
he uses the word agape here, which is, we talked about it earlier, it's that unconditional love. Be an example in agape. In other words, love and seek their good, even if they despise you because you're young. Love them till they love you back. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just keep on pouring out love on them. Sooner or later it'll get through. But also I think what he's talking here too is, you know, be loyal or have a loyal heart at all cost. You know, give yourself entirely to this stuff. All these prophecies about you, give yourself, meditate on it, right? And also, be an example in purity. So purity of heart. So you got to love with all your heart to seek out people's good. you got to have a loyal heart at all costs, loyal to the things of God. And you've got to have a purity of heart to be an example. Right? You can't be, you know, on the corner with the guys telling dirty jokes to one another. You know? There's guys being guys, and then there's crossing the line. And you've got to understand, if you're going to really make an impact, ask the Lord where that line is, and don't cross it, right? As was said, read the Word publicly. And this involved teaching, exhorting, praying for folks, all that. You know, right now we're reading the Bible publicly. The doors are open. People can come in, right? We've got a new friend tonight, Mike. You know? But in that, it's also teaching. It's exhorting. Calling people up to a higher level. And now speaking of calling is, remember your calling. Remember who you are. Remember whose you are. Right? The laying on of hands and the prophecies. Don't neglect that. You know, I think in 1 Thessalonians 5, it says basically, uh, don't despise prophecies. You know what I mean? By neglecting, we end up despising them. But remember who you are. Have an understanding of what your gifts are. How God wants to use you. Who He's destined you for. Remember, we talked about it last week. Uh, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. It's by grace you've been saved through faith, not of yourself. The gift of God, not of works. That no man can boast. In verse 10, for God has preordained good works for you to do. We talked about that. So, you know, as long as you're on this planet, guess what? God's got something for you to do. Mike Murdoch says, you were born to solve a problem. Any work you do, you're solving someone's problem. Right? Uh, I edit the newspaper column. Yeah. You solve the problem for the writer. They don't have to edit it. You do it. Right? My dad, he's coming up on 70 uh, years old pretty soon. And he's still putting up fences. He's solving problems because people have a problem with, you know, whether it be animals getting in the yard or people seeing in people's yards. Mm -hmm. His job, he's solving their problem of keeping things out. Mm -hmm. Right? As long as you're on this planet, there's a problem for you to solve. Your mouth can encourage somebody, can exhort somebody Amen. to help lift them to a higher place of belief. Right? We had people lining up in the altars on Sunday for prayer. You know, God was using pastor, myself, the leadership team to bless people. To help them move to a higher level or beyond things that were hurting them or trapping them. It gave them hope. It gave them a touch of the Lord. We're solving problems. He says, remember, think on it. Concentrate on it. And be progressing at it. Right? Doesn't he say that? In not so many words? Continue in them, for in doing this... Oh, wait, wait, I'm going to go back up. Verse 15, meditate on these things, give yourself entirely to them, that your progress may be evident to all. We're supposed to be growing, right? Doesn't God's Word say He takes us from glory to glory? Faith to faith? Strength to strength? Give yourself entirely 
into the things of God, into the teachings of God, into the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and you're going to see growth in your life. You know, it's funny talking to my friend about his genius brother, who's not so genius, and that he has, you know, we were talking about um, knowledge. And I mentioned, I said, knowledge puffs up, love builds up. So you can have all the knowledge in the world and yet not be growing in the things of God. Because you're not exercising what you know. If he really knew God's word, that genius, it says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. As some have gotten the habit of doing. It doesn't say, once you read the Bible, you're good to go. Bye. Have a nice day. <laughs> right? It's like my uh, pastor friend in Las Vegas used to do a lot of counseling, and he was uh, counseling the mentally ill. Uh, at one time, and this mentally ill person, he was sitting next to him, and the guy says, well, I don't believe in hell. And the pastor said, well, it's in the Bible. And the guy says, no, it's not. And the pastor said, well, give me your Bible. And the guy says, sure, here you go. And the pastor went to all the places that had hell in it, and it was crossed out with a black marker. And when he found it, the guy says, see, I told you, it's not in my Bible. <laughs> You can't change it. <laughs> and you can have all the knowledge you want, but that ain't going to save you. <laughs> that, was Pastor, that was Pastor Paul, Pastor Paul Goulet, that, he, he, that happened to him. <laughs> it did? Yeah, before he ever became a pastor and he was doing counseling centers. No, no, it was the guy that he was visiting. He was the pastor visiting the guy. And that's, he was telling the story to us. I need a my Bible. <laughs> The guy was saying he didn't believe in hell. It's called denial. <laughs> That's yeah. what it's called. <laughs> denial. He says he knows the words, so he doesn't need to come to church, but in the Bible it says even demons know the words of the Lord and rebuke it. Yes. Right. And even because you know it doesn't mean you accept it and believe it. And believe it. Right. That's right. And your actions will show yeah. what you believe. Right? And you know what? When you get to heaven, you're going to find out what you don't know. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Wow. You know, but I, I told, uh, it's funny, this whole conversation um, planted a good seed in my friend's heart because I said, uh, you know, when I mentioned knowledge puffs up, love builds up, he goes, oh, that's a good one. I go, well, that's actually a Bible verse. That's not mine. You know, like, I didn't make that up. That's St. That's Paul, you know. So let's wrap things up. To be like yeah, you, you know, basically as we, as we get down to this, take heed to yourself, the doctrine, continue with them for in so doing, you'll save both yourself and those who hear you. You know, um, Paul said in one, I think it was in Colossians, pray that God opens a door for me, mm. you know, where he was going. And so everything we do should be birthed in prayer. You know, you know, there's there's a part of um, the walk that says, you know what, God's going to be with you regardless. But if you're going to do like a work for God, really let nothing be done without first being birthed in prayer. Do you understand? Sometimes this is what happens. We get a word from God and we get excited. So we get into this do, 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 do mode. But God's giving you the plan, and then He gives you the building blocks for that plan. Does that make sense? It's, it's not always. Now, if you see somebody on the street, you know, you don't need a plan from God to feed them who needs food. <laughs> you know? Especially when you know someone's there, you can already just buy food. Drive up, here you go, have a nice day. You know what I mean? Like, whatever. I'm not talking about that stuff. I'm talking about like a work for God. You know, growing a church. you got to start somewhere, somehow. But, you know, you're not just going to like plant an acorn and have an oak tree in your backyard the next day. You know what I mean? Pray this through. Seek God on certain things. You know what I mean? Birth things in prayer. That's why I say pray to be more like Christ. Because the more like Him you are, the more in line 
you're walking in the pathway God has for you. Because everything you do, people are going to want to see your character first. Yep. Am I right? Yes. It doesn't mean you're perfect. Because we live in this stuff called the flesh. Yeah. And the flesh is bad. Paul says, everywhere I go, evil is right there with me. Sometimes we're pulling jackets off of people that's not our jacket. Oh, Nate. <laughs> just, think, just thinking out loud, that's all. Hello. Hey, how you doing? It's nice. <laughs> we live in the flesh. And we live by the impulses sometimes of the flesh. So you're not going to be perfect. But people know sincere character. Kabish? Mm -hmm. So let's pray right now. Why don't we stand to become more like Christ?